Amen. Let's go to Galatians. No, we won't finish the book tonight. We might finish chapter five. And um, maybe. That's a big maybe. But um, let's go to Galatians chapter five. And for some reason, it seems like it's been a long time. That's on me. <laughs> We're only going to go through about five, six verses tonight. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> We're going to pick up on Galatians 5, verse 22. We finished out uh, last week in verse 21 where Paul was concluding a listing of the works of the flesh. And um, those, I like to say, they're the works of the Adamic nature and expressed through us. We're not to walk after the flesh, but by the Spirit. Amen? But he made a statement at the end saying that, um, after he said, the revelings and such like, of which I tell you before, as I also have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So we expect to see those things manifest in those who don't know Jesus. Uh, once we are born again, we receive a new nature. And even though we don't walk in the fullness of our redemption yet, as we go on in the Lord, even if some of these things are manifesting in us, we ought to grow better at looking more like Jesus. Amen. You know, if we see somebody been saved 30 years and they have no fruit, yeah, it's time to look at the root. Well, pastor, you can't judge. Well, the Bible says judge righteous judgment. And the Bible also tells us to be fruit inspectors. A lot of people, you know, you can't judge a person's salvation by the external fruit. A lot of people who don't know Jesus might display some of what we call Christian graces more so than we do. Amen. The only way you can tell is the engagement conversation. Amen. That's why we can't go by how good they look like they're living. Well, they got to be a Christian. No, not necessarily. Amen. So we need to find out, don't we? There are a lot of what we would call morally good people in the world. They live an upright life in the flesh. Everybody that don't know Jesus don't walk in what we see this list here in expression of all of those works of the flesh because they're trying to be good. They're moral. But being moral is not salvation. Amen? Praise God. Now, we ought to have good morality because we are saved. Amen. And so Paul is writing to a group of uh, professed believers who've gotten tripped up. And they are being pulled back into the works of the flesh under the law. And at one point, Paul even said, you know, I stand doubt of, I'm in doubt of you. Are you really who you said you were? And now he finishes out this section. He's contrasting the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. You know, from time to time, we need to do that. One of the things that I think we fall short of in our walk from time to time is, is what 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine ourselves. We don't tend to look at ourselves by, well, we'll, we'll judge other people. But do we look at ourselves in a scrutinizing way to see if we're really all what we profess to be. Amen? And so as we come across these scriptures tonight, we can kind of measure where we are by these because we're about to look at, notice after he said at the beginning of verse 22, let's read verse uh, 22 and 23 because he crammed a lot into those two verses. In that verse, he's got nine manifestations of the Spirit of God in us as we are bad in Jesus. And he just kind of ran on, it seems like. But um, let's read these. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, remember, he's been teaching throughout this book um, to a people who've been under the pressure to go back under the law by a group of false teachers called Judaizers. 
And so Paul makes this statement against these nine fruit of the spirit. There is no law. We'll look at that in a little bit. And so, but the first word kind of sets that contrast between the fruit and the flesh. And so notice it says, but the fruit. And so if we were looking at the works of the flesh, he said, these are, these are, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. We looked at all of those last week. Various immolations, rash strifes, seditions, heresies, envy and murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. But the fruit of the Spirit. See that contrast? So there's something about the fruit of the Spirit that stands in opposition or against. It stands it's opposite this work of the flesh that we see here. Now, so he defends that by saying, but the fruit of the spirit is. So these are things that are produced in us by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, what's fruit? See, uh, yeah, fruit is something we eat. See, <laughs> y'all leave it to me to ask what seems like a simple question like that. But think about that for a second. What is fruit? You eat, generally eat fruit. But there are some fruits that are produced that we don't eat. They're not good for us, aren't they? You know, so in general, fruits are edible, something that we eat. Um, but what is fruit when you think about it? Okay, it's a result of an action. Um, it, does, it does represent our growth. Uh-huh. It can represent our attitude, yeah. Yeah, fruit is something we eat. Uh, okay. <laughs> Amen. It is. Yes, sir. Um, fruit is a characteristic. See, we all produce some kind of fruit. We bear something. Amen. Now, if you are looking at just a general definition of fruit, it's a product which a plant, tree, or an individual produces as a means to propagate itself. See, it's good to us as food, but to the plant, no, that's not just food. That's how I'm going to carry on to the next generation of whatever I am. Amen. See, beginning in Genesis 1 11, the Bible says the seed is in itself. What the fruit is, is the container for the seed. As that fruit begins to decay, it provides nourishment for that seed so it can germinate in the ground. Amen. So it's more than so to the tree, the apple tree, the fruit has nothing to do with you and I liking it. That fruit is a carrier of its seed so there can be more apple trees and more pear trees and more peach trees. Amen, or snap beans and navy beans or whatever else. The purpose of the seed from that perspective is to reproduce itself. So it is with us. Amen. Our children are called, in, in Psalms uh, 127.4, the fruit of our womb. Well, God said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Amen. So the fruit is a way of propagating whatever it is, whether it's a a fruit, whether it's a vegetable, whether it's a human being, you know. And so the seed generally is in the fruit, always, <laughs> amen. And it's a way to propagate itself. And so children are the fruit of the womb, we said. And, um, and the fruit produced always is an indication well, actually, anything can only reproduce based upon the seed that was planted. Amen. Now, the Bible says his seed is in us. And because his seed is in us, there are certain kinds of fruit that you and I should produce as believers. Now, from that perspective, the fruit is the visible manifestation of the inner condition of an individual. Hmm. So if over time, if I'm in Christ, there should be certain fruits that are seen of others. That's how our light shine. 
There should be some changes in how we deport, how we carry ourselves that are visible to the world. Remember with Peter, he was producing something that wasn't like most Galileans or fishermen. And so when Jesus was being tried, he's standing out there by the fire warming himself and said, uh, you know, yeah, I, I saw you with Jesus. No, no, you didn't. Yeah, did another one. Can, yeah, you, yeah, 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 I, I saw you too. And what did Peter do? He cursed. Amen. And um, one of them said before he did that, your speech betrays you. So something in the way he carried himself, let him know that he'd been with Jesus. See, there was some fruit being produced and he spoke opposite that to try and separate himself from Jesus. There ought to be something over time in us that kind of distinguishes us from the world. Amen. People in the world where well, they don't even have to get mad to cuss and swear now. They just do it as a manner of speech. But well, that shouldn't be you and I. Our speech ought to betray us, shouldn't it? In other words, the fruit we produce should distinguish us and shine the light on who we serve because we don't have the seed of Adam. Amen. We're born again of an incorruptible seed by the word of God. And that word produces fruit in us as we abide in Jesus. So he says, now the fruit of the spirit is. Amen. And these are manifestations then of the indwelling presence of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. As we abide in him, we begin to produce fruit. Amen. So if you would, let's go to John chapter 15, because the nature of the fruit is based on. Let's just go to John 15 and we'll see what the Lord Jesus says about this. He's talking about the van here. We're all familiar with this. And so thank God that I like good fruit. Amen. But praise God. Amen. There's some fruit God wants to produce in us. In verse 15, verse 1, G chapter 15, 1, Jesus said, I am the true van, and my father is a husbandman. He's a gardener. Now, we're garden. We're garden. We are God's husbandry, Paul said. Amen. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the van, no more can ye except ye abide in me. In other words, we don't produce the fruit. Amen. It's a result of, result of us abide and that word abide means to stay. Stay connected. Amen. We don't have to... Um, Force the fruit, you know, trees don't force themselves to bear fruit. They just need to stay connected to the trunk. And the trunk <laughs> draws this nourishment up through the root system, doesn't it? The root. And so if we stay connected, if we stay in fellowship, if we stay in communion with the Lord Jesus as a byproduct, you and I will produce certain fruit. We have to strain at it. Amen. It's him working in us, both the will and the do. His good pleasure. Amen. Now notice he said, abide in me and I in you. Stay, dwell. As the fruit branch cannot bear fruit of itself. So it's not something we produce, is it? Except you abide in the van, no more can ye except you abide in me. I am the van, ye are the branches. He that abided in me and I in him, the same bring it forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. See, some, yeah, we just need to relax in Jesus. Enjoy the ride. And as we do, he'll begin to produce. Sometimes we struggle against it and we make it harder. But what we need to do is, is just rest in our walk, our relationship with the Lord. Amen. Stay connected. Um, all the stuff that's going on in the world around us, amen, is to get us out of fellowship. To get us out of a place of faith and to fear. To get us to doubt and not express some of these things, these characteristics. And when we're not in that position of, of staying in him, abiding in him, then all the other things that are in the world, they, they, they begin to affect us more than they ought to. Amen? These are supernatural fruit he's talking about. We can't produce them. It's not in us. Amen. It's the power 
of the Holy Spirit being expressed in our lives, conforming us to be more like Jesus. Now, in these fruits, we see nine of them. And in these nine, I see three groupings. Amen? Three groupings of nine fruit. And now, notice here, in these groupings, let's go back to Galatians 5. And if you like me, I stuck a sticky pad at that man, so I'm back to it. And I'm going to call them personal fruit, outreaching fruit, and upreaching fruit. Now, notice the first grouping is love, joy, and peace. The second grouping of fruit, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. You know, it really reflects our response to how other folk treat us. The personal fruit is a direct result of the Spirit of God indwelling us. So our walk with God, first three, how we respond to others, the second three. And the third three, and what are they? Faith, meekness, and temperance. They affect our conduct. You know, how we ought to be because we're led and indwelt by the Spirit of God. Now, the personal fruit, the first one is love. Say love. Why do you think the first fruit mentioned here, and I don't think it's by accident, is love? Amen. To love him. Amen. It's foundational then. Amen. First John 4, eight says God is love. Amen. And we are commanded by Jesus, by this shall all men know that we are his disciples because we have love one for another. We are to love the Lord first. See, this is our foundation, isn't it? With all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our might, and our neighbor. Amen. As thyself. So if they treat me ugly, it's going to take this type of love to love them. Because if I'm in the flesh... We don't treat them back in a loving manner, manner, do we? So we're not responding after our Adamic nature. This is by the Spirit of God. So the love of God is foundational for all the other fruit. It's the love of God expressed through us. And we can do this, beloved. He said, Pastor, I can't love them. You don't know what they did. Wait a minute. Let's put the word on that. Now, that actually ties in with another fruit called meekness. But um, let's put the word on that for a minute. Can I really love the unlovely? Is it in me to do it? The Bible says God is love. Well, guess what? The same love that he had for us, that without condition of us even responding back, he came to save us. That's the kind of love. That's what this word is here, sagape. You know, it's, it's that love that loves without being loved back. So if we have this love in us, then we're not going to respond to the world based on how they treated us. We're going to still love them. We're going to still do good for them. Amen? Amen. So we're not going to just act like they should. Well, I, I don't see why I ought to treat them that way. No, no, no. That's not this type of love. And see, that's not normal for us. If somebody don't like us, the normal tendency for a lot of people is not to like them back. But we are not normal people. <laughs> Amen. We're not mere humans. We're human, but we've been born again of the Spirit of God. Now go to Romans chapter 5. Amen. So if we ever wonder, can I love the unlovely? If I can't, I'm actually denying my nature and stifling the fruit from manifesting in my life. Now notice here in Romans chapter 5, Paul is laying something here foundationally too. He says, and not only so, verse 3, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation work at patience. You could say long suffering there. Or endurance and patience experience and experience hope and hope make it not ashamed because the what the love of God the love of God the agape of God is shared abroad in y'all's hearts our hearts so that means you and I we're born of the love of God that love is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit so you and I have the potential to love like God loves 
Amen. But we'll never attain that unless we stay planted and connected and abiding in him so that he can love them through us. And generally, when we're talking about loving people, we're talking about loving them with feelings. Agape is loving them with our actions. Amen. It doesn't carry a warm and fuzzy feeling like phileo love, brotherly love. Amen. Doesn't carry a hot, passionate thought with it like arrows or or a brotherly or love you have for your family like store game. No, 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 no. This love doesn't act based on feeling. This is a love by choice. And see, it takes the spirit of God to work that out in us. So we don't act out of our flesh. We act as we're led by the spirit of God. This is how we love the unlovely. First, we need to settle the issue. That love is shared abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I can love. Amen. Hallelujah. But remember, thank God, our actions precede our feelings. So we need to act it. Amen. Amen. Do the actions of love and the feelings will follow. We're not led by feelings. We do what we ought to. Amen. So if I love God, that means I'm going to obey him. Amen. Lord, I don't understand. I don't have to understand because I love you. I'll do it. <laughs> Amen. See, this is a higher type of love than what the world can really walk in. And, um, but it's the foundation for the fruit that God wants to grow in us. It's in our hearts. Now, notice Paul said there, that didn't come of us. It was shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. So that really agrees with John 15 and what we see here. It's not of us. It's of him. The ability to love that way comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't have to generate it. We just need to relax and allow him to love through us. Amen. See, that's the key. We're looking to feel good, like forgiveness. People do that with forgiveness, too. You want to feel, feel like you ought to forgive them. Nope. Forgiveness is a decision of will. And then after you forgive in faith, in obedience, then your feelings can begin to be affected. Hmm. Hmm. See, if you wait till you feel like forgiving, you might ever, might not ever. <laughs> but if I do it out of obedience, then God can change the way I feel toward that individual. Amen. The second one is joy. Say joy. Then a word there, kara, a kira, and I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, means cheerfulness. But it's not just any kind of cheerfulness. It's having a sense of joy or a hopeful disposition about you so much that you can be cheerful in your disposition no matter what your circumstances are. In other words, you know, it's not based on whether you have a job or everybody likes you. Amen. This joy is that inner quality, that knowing, that joyfulness on the inside that the Bible says this is a joy that didn't come from us too. Amen. Amen. So we have to fall back on what he gave. It's being hopeful and cheerful in adverse circumstances. Wow, people need joy today, don't they? With all the stuff they hear and all the things they're experiencing, man, if our joy was based on circumstance, you know, then you'd be joyless and in despair and some in anger. But thank God we don't have to rely on our externals for joy. Amen. That comes on the inside. It's not our joy. It's his joy. Amen. Go to John 15, 11. Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you, that my joy, my cheerfulness. You know, people get the wrong impression about Jesus. They talk about Jesus being grave. No, 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 no. You know, um, acquainted with sorrows. How many has heard that before about Jesus? And, to, and see what it is, they're taking it out of context. Isaiah 53 describes what pe pe people, um, how people saw Jesus on the way to Calvary. 
He's beat within, within an inch of his life. His beard is plucked out. And he gave his back to the smiters and to those that plucked out the beard. Oh, yeah, and you would say, woo. You know, surely. But the Bible says he was bearing our griefs and carried our sor sorrows. Men saw him one way externally. But the Bible says concerning Jesus going through that suffering in Hebrews 12, for the joy set before him. So even when he was under duress and strain, severe beatings and all those things, he still, oh, he said, my joy. In Hebrews chapter 1 or 2, yeah, you find that he was anointed with the oil of joy above all his fellows. So Jesus went walking around. I, Jesus had a great sense of humor. See, you never look for that in the Bible, do you? After Jesus was raised from the dead, you know, he pulls up beside and disguises himself. Two men walking on the road to Emmaus. Y'all remember reading that? And, um, and so they're discussing what happened. And they're talking, and Jesus comes, all the things that had happened that day. They're talking about they supposed that he was going to be hope of Israel. And they're talking about all these things. You know what Jesus walked up and said? What things? Now, wait a minute. He experienced all those things. Psalms 2 talks about he that sitteth in the heavens. He's going to laugh. You know, so our impression what joy is. We can have a cheerful disposition even when things are bad for us. Because this joy is generated internally by the indwelling spirit of God. And therefore we can have it in the very worst of circumstances. Notice what else Jesus said. John 14, 27, uh, no, 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 that's about peace. But these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. So there's a connection between this joyful disposition that is worked in us by the Spirit of God and our knowledge of the Word of God. These things have I spoken unto you. He said that my joy might remain in you and that, you're, and that it may be full. No, the Spirit of God is working in us joy. Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so this is something that he works in us as we are bad in him. Notice the third one, peace. The word there is irony. Amen. You know, so the same way that the love of God is shed abroad in our heart and Jesus says, my joy might remain in you. He also says his peace. See, we don't have the ability to walk in this kind of peace in and of ourselves. So the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. And um, again, this is a gift from the Lord Jesus to us. He said, my peace give I you. Let's read John 14, 27. And Jesus is at this point preparing them for his, his dying. John 14. He says, peace I leave with you. What is this peace? It's that settled quality of on the inside, no matter what's going on on the outside. Inwardly, you know things are going to work out. So you're not disturbed. You're not nervous. But we need this peace, don't we? Amen? Yeah. I mean, Jesus had that peace. He's in a boat. The boat's rocking, waves beating it, water coming in it. He got peace. He in the ship sleep. Everybody else thought they were going to perish. It takes peace to be able to go through a storm and not be, um, you know, kind of pulling your hair out. Worrying, how's it going to work out? Jesus said, peace. Let's read this verse together. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Stop. Who's it coming from? Jesus. Okay, now here comes a contrast between this peace and what's out there. Let's read the rest. Not as the world give it. 
give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What do you think the major difference between the peace of God and the peace of the world is? It's a huge difference. In the world, peace, actually, you know, even in our homes, you know, we, <laughs> we were growing up when our parents were scolding us for running, tearing stuff up. <laughs> you know, peace to them is when we settled down, wasn't it? And if we didn't settle down, they would help us to settle down so they could have some peace. Can't get no peace in this house with y'all doing all of this. In a worldly sense, peace then is generally when nothing's disturbing us. Everything around us is settled and quiet externally. Well, you know, that's how peace is in the world, you know. And by that standard, no wonder there's no peace in the world because of people worried about all the stuff that we see happening in the world. And they don't have a peace where everything around them is being shaken and around us is being shaken. But in the middle of everything that is around us being shaken, we can still have this Irene, this type of peace on the inside, that settled quality anointing. It is okay because I'm not generating this peace. He said, my peace give I you, not as the world give it. Let not my heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. So in, the, in spite of all the stuff we see going on. John 16, 33, he says, These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. See, so we're to have this peace in us, not coming externally based on what's happening, but generated internally by the indwelling presence of God. He gave us peace. So we can have peace in the middle of the storm, middle of COVID, middle of people acting crazy. We can have an inner peace. Actually, when people look at you and they're going, man, how come you're not worried? You're not worried about, man, that, that vaccine, you, 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 you get, hey, you got peace. I told somebody the other day, the worst anything can do is get me to see Jesus soon. See, we got to get our perspective right, don't we? Amen. Everything about us is better. For the joy set before us, we go through all of this. Amen. And so whatever they bring, whatever the world brings on the inside, see, this is that peace. What does Philippians 4, 7 say? That passes all understanding shall guard our hearts and man's in Christ Jesus. So there's a peace where sometimes you don't even understand why you're not upset about what's happening around you. That's the peace of God keeping you. He gave us that. And so with all the things we hear, man, if you look at all the stuff that's just happened, even in a natural sense over the last few days, you know, where they're doing stuff that going to make gas go higher and all of that. And I'm going, oh, man, I like these cheap prices. Yeah, but I'm going to have peace. Gas prices not going to affect my peace. Amen. Huh? Been up before. <laughs> Amen. See, that's the experience. And Romans 5, 5 says that experience make it not a shame. See, once we allow ourselves to put it in this word's perspective, it gets a lot better for us. But he gave us this peace that passes understanding. So sometimes we'll be wondering, man, you ever wonder, how come I'm not bothered by that? See, that's his peace. Now, if we allow the trouble to come in, he said, Neither let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We have the peace of God. Amen. Now, we grow in that as we abide. Now, if we cut off ourselves and we disfellowship from the Lord Jesus by getting in fear and anger and doubt and everything else, yeah, then we won't have the peace, we won't have the joy, and we won't walk in the love. It's based on our relationship with him. All we are called to do is to rest in him. Amen. See, it sort of sounds like Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. See, it's a, as we rest in him, as we lay back in our relationship with him, not straining against the, 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 the van, I'm just allowing him to nourish me. 
They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and we will mount up with wings as eagles and we'll what? We'll run and not be weary and we'll walk and not think. Because we are back, we're staying connected. Amen. As long as the, the, uh, the branch stays connected, we're the branches. As long as we stay connected to the van, this fruit is a byproduct of that connected, being connected to him. And what the world tries to do and what Satan tries to do and what people try and do is cut us off. Amen. The enemy wants us to break our fellowship with the Lord Jesus through sin. Amen. Through rage and anger, fear. And what we're to do is to stay connected and just draw our resources and our strength from him. And so as I do that, I can have the peace of God that passes all understanding and it will keep my heart in man. That, that means or keep means to guard it in Christ Jesus. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to stay connected, aren't we? Now, this second group, that's why um, um, these are personal in that sense. These are things that he produces in us as individuals as we stay in that relationship with him. Amen. The second fruit is one we call outreaching fruit. That's the ability of us, you and I, through the power of the Holy Spirit to respond rightly to other people. Amen. And the first one is long suffering. Man, that just don't sound good. Gentleness. When you feel like bashing them. Goodness. They ain't never done nothing good for me. See, that would be the flesh. <laughs> oh, but the fruit of the spirit is long suffering. You know, that word simply means forbearance. Forbearance, you put up with it. You put up with others' behavior because your response to their behavior could be an open door to win them to Jesus. Amen. So we're not responding in an unlovely way to unlovely people. Amen. When they treat us bad, the forbearing person is going to do good, thereby heaping hot coals of fire on their heads. And they go, Why, what? don't you know what I, you ever hear somebody, don't you know what I just did? <coughs> yeah, I know. I love you. More importantly, the Lord loves you. He wants to do a work in your life. He wants to save you. Amen. In other words, we put up with bad behavior because we have a higher motive. We want to win them to Jesus. Amen. The world is going to act like the world acts. But when the Spirit of God is working through us, we can put up with their actions because God has a higher purpose. He wants our response to be one to win them over. So we're going to forbear and put up with some of those things, even though we didn't do anything to reserve it. Simply means we don't retaliate when we're treated wrong. So if this fruit is operating in you, you're not looking for vengeance. Amen. No, this kind of love, uh-oh, 1 Corinthians 13, suffers long, is long suffering, isn't it? Put stuff with behavior that is not good because we're going to do like Jesus you know, he, he's long-suffering to us too, isn't he? The Bible says he's long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish. If you wonder why God hadn't, you know, if, if we were God. <laughs> I remember years ago when uh, this church was first begun, um, Pastor Bradford's wife used to say, if I had the gift of zap. <laughs> well, you know, because <laughs> in the flesh, people's behavior is like, if I were God, I would just light them both. But I'm glad God didn't like that. And you you might have wanted the gift of zap sometime too. Amen. But you couldn't do it. Something restrained you. This grace. You didn't retaliate it when you were treated bad. You had a feel like in the in the natural it might feel like you had a right to, but you chose not to. And then you wanted, man. I remember when I never would have put up with that. See, that's an evidence that there's a change in you. God is producing a fruit in you. 
Amen. There are a lot of things we can look at as a man. Man, back in the day, you know, no way. Well, thank God we're, in a, we're a new person. We're in a new day. And we do things a new way now, don't we? So because you treated me ugly, I'm not going to treat you ugly. Amen. Not going to retaliate and do what you did. In other words, some people, they ho- this doesn't hold grudges. Doesn't throw stuff in your face. I don't like when people throw stuff in my face. <laughs> you know, they want me to do something. I didn't do it. Well, you, I did. No, 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 no. See, this grace doesn't operate that way. Amen. Doesn't retaliate. Even when it's treated wrongly. So it's the spirit of God that grows this in us. Amen. Notice in Colossians 1 verse 11. And see, these, this is how the Spirit of God, grow, he's growing us up. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. <laughs> Man, that's going to take the Lord, isn't it? So we see right here patience, long suffering, and joyfulness in this verse. But that helps us to reach people, don't it? Because they wonder, what is it about you? They see you get treated bad at work. And yet you're still faithful worker. You still show up on time. You still give an honest day's work. <laughs> Amen. Somebody chewed you out and you didn't use bad. You may, maybe you stood your ground as you maybe should have, but you didn't divert into bad language. You didn't look to get them. And somebody's wondering why they're watching you. I saw that, you know. And yet you still got a smile on your face. In other words, that grace working on the inside of you, opening the door so that we can be a witness. And in the flesh, it's hard to do that, isn't it? Amen, yeah. But we're not of the, in the flesh, we're in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God indwell us. So we come down from our position and get in the flesh when we do these things, but we're growing, aren't we? Amen. All of us get in the flesh at some time, Amen. The thing to do is not don't, don't wallow and beat yourself. Get up and get back in the game. Amen. Amen. You know, sometimes Satan don't have to beat us. We do a good job. <laughs> All he got to do is start it. <laughs> and then we'll keep it up. Now repent and get back in the game. Keep going. Amen. What's the next one? Gentleness. It simply means kindness and goodness. It's benevolence expressed in action, such as God displayed toward us. Romans 2, 4 says it's the goodness of God that drew us to repentance. In other words, it didn't treat, God didn't treat us as, he didn't treat us like we deserve to be treated. Amen. The goodness of God leads to repentance. So God don't try and kill us so he can save us. We get a revelation of how Good he is. He loves us. Amen. Now, I know some people get saved because they, you know, they thought they were going to die or something like that. Yeah, you know, God will save us irregardless if we come to him in repentance. But even then, it's God's goodness that saved us. Amen. So God is good. You know, we like to say, and we say he's good all the time, don't we? You know, so this word gentleness, the same word in the Greek is the word for goodness. And that's why we can say the goodness of God drew us to repentance. When you, you recognize I wasn't worthy of what God has offered me, but God is good. His mercy endures to all generations. He does not reward us after our sins or repay us after our iniquity. Amen. He receives us. Amen. We weren't worthy. We couldn't make ourselves worthy. We couldn't redeem ourselves. Our works couldn't save us. But in his goodness, he reached out to us and he pursued us. Amen. You know, God is good, isn't he? Notice in 2 Corinthians 6, 6. I remember some of the older saints who said, God is better to me than I've been to myself. It's true when we think about it. He really is good. Paul here talking about all the things that he suffered here. It says by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, love unfeigned. The word kindness, there's the same word that is used in Galatians for gentleness. Amen. You know, so in the middle of all this stuff he's going through, he acknowledged that God is kind. Um, gentle in disposition toward us. Amen. 
Well, goodness, say goodness. How is this fruit expressed in our lives? Jesus made a statement that if you only do good to those that do good to you, that's not much. You know, I didn't know that's a paraphrase. But when someone treats us wrong and we do good, that's what he's talking about. Amen. He said even the publicans treat people good that treat them good. See, we're called to walk on a higher level. And that's not our flesh response. You know, sometimes because people treated us in an ill manner or a bad way, and we see something happen to them, I don't know about you, but I've experienced this before where I had to catch myself because my flesh for a moment wanted to, they got what's coming. I know y'all sanctified folk never <laughs> had a thought like that before, did you? And yet, and you catch yourself saying, well, no, mm -mm, no, no, Lord. You know, you know that's your flesh. Amen. But over time, you know, you get those things don't happen as often. You're growing. And so when you see somebody get what's coming to them, you, rather than the flesh feel a sense like, yeah, I knew and you pray for them. You pray that the Lord save them and draw them to repentance. And it's compassion that arises in you then as opposed to a sense they got what was coming to them. Amen? See, that's because the Holy Spirit is growing in us. We're not producing the fruit of the flesh at that point. It's the fruit of the Spirit um, being expressed through us at that point. So we're not happy to see. We don't rejoice when uh, we see bad things happen to people, no matter how bad they've been. You know, and so God is changing us as we draw strength from him, a bad and in him. And so it's producing that gentleness in us, that goodness. One described it, one commentary, and I wrote it down, says, Benevolence in action, such as God displayed toward us. Gentleness from God to us, Romans 2, 4, led to our salvation. Gentleness from us to others can bring them convic conviction and a means by where God can draw them. Amen. Be not overcome with Evil, but overcome evil with good. Same word. So that means good is greater than evil, doesn't it? And so as we begin to grow in allowing God to demonstrate that through us, that alone can convict people. They wonder, why are you doing this? Just love you. Amen. Nobody ever did anything like this for me before. That affects people. Amen. And, she, and that's how we're to allow the Spirit of God to operate through us. We're growing fruit. See, we're the fruit-bearing part of the body of Christ. The only Jesus one person said the world will ever see is the Jesus Christ in you and in me. So if we don't bear fruit, how are they going to know that we're his? The Bible says they will know that we're his children by our love. They, they knew that Peter was a disciple. His speech betrayed him. He didn't talk like a fisherman. They would only be gruff, rough in speech and behavior. Something changed him. Well, the same one that changed him is changing us, isn't it? Let's go here. I'm going to divert for a minute. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 3. Verse 17 says, now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is <laughs> liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image. See, that's a bad end are changed into the same image from glory unto glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. See, if we are bad, if we just stay on course, if we just stay in him, 
If we just keep our eyes on Jesus, as we look at Jesus, Jesus is changing us. Amen. And all the things that are out there to break that fellowship, that communion, to get us disconnected so we will cease to produce fruit. Amen. But we are fruit bearing. We're the fruit bearing part. And as they see that fruit, it's a reflection of who God is. And they can't, that's how we overcome. Amen. That is our testimony. It's the fruit we bear. The change in our lives. We have a testimony that Jesus changed us. Every Christian has that. Amen. If all I know to share is how I got saved, that's enough. Amen. Too many people think you're here to be the lowest of this, that, and the other. And that's how you have a testimony. To, no test, no testimony. Everybody didn't go through the same thing. But everybody that say knew they were a sinner. And they found out he's a wonderful savior. Amen. And so we have a testimony of what God has done for us. Let's look at the last three. Let's go back to Galatians 5. Meekness, temperance, faith, faith, faith. The first of what I call upreaching fruit. Faith, say faith, faith. meekness, and temperance. Amen. Now, what do you think faith is? This is a fruit of the Spirit called faith. Okay, see, yeah, the word pistis, faith. This one is faithfulness. So, depending on your translation, or if you look at the word, you see faithfulness. See, faith is what I believe toward God. Remember, we're abiding in the van. This is something he produces in us. Uh-huh. Uh, no, faithfulness is trustworthiness, reliable. Over time, God should be able to count on us. See, remember in Luke 18, 8, it says, When the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? And you're seeing your reference, faithfulness. Will he find people that he can count on? to represent him when he comes, which sets the setting for the last days when many will depart from the faith and you don't see a, a lot of faithfulness in the body of Christ today, yeah. Yeah, it would be consistency. So the fruit of the Spirit is going to take us from being yo-yo Christians. Amen. Because they're excited about God, God when God is doing something good for them, but they go through a rough patch, and then they're mad at God, up and down. That's not faithfulness, yes. Hmm? Excuse me? Dependable, yeah, that's a good word. So this word here, the fruit of the Spirit, is producing in us faithfulness, dependability, reliability, consistency, trustworthiness, and as God can trust us to be faithful in our little, then he can make us ruler over much. So he's working in us the quality of being dependable toward him. That's why I call it upreaching. When we're talking about faith in general, it's us reaching up to pull something down. Amen. And so that faith grows by us hearing and hearing by the word of God. This faithfulness comes as we are bad in him and he reproduces his nature in us. The Bible says concerning Jesus, he's faithful. Amen. And he abides faithful. If we deny him, he cannot deny himself. See, Jesus is always trustworthy. trustworthy. He's always reliable. He's always dependable. Amen. That means he doesn't change with the weather. Amen. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I can always trust him. Amen. I can trust him today, and I trust my tomorrow to him. Amen. Why? Because I know he's faithful to keep me. I'm going to tell you, knowing God is faithful, 
encourages me because there are times you ever felt like, like man, will I ever really uh, become what God wants me to be? And then I see a scripture like Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, we're performing into the day of Jesus. Why? Not because I'm so faithful. It's because he's faithful. See, God's going to get me where he wants me to be as long as I stay connected to him. Amen. And so he's going to work it out. He's going to bring all things together for my good if I stay connected. Amen. He's faithful. Praise God. Amen. Glory to God. I thank God. God is faithful, saints. Amen. Mm. And you know, as we prove ourselves faithful, God can have faith in us. That's why it says if I'm faithful in little, he can make me rule over much. Amen. See, God tests our faithfulness. And that is one thing he said wouldn't be in Abundance when he returned in Luke 18, 8. Faithful believers. One thing I catch myself seeing much uh, more now than in the past, I just want to finish well. Because too many believers don't finish well. Amen. In the fourth quarter of the race and they give out. Amen. Now we're going to finish strong. Amen. We're going to be faithful. That remnant that he's returning for, that's where we want to be that he would find us faithful. Amen? Go to Hebrews chapter 3. And um, I thought I, we would just breeze through this tonight. And then I got really impressed. We need to slow down and go through it. Hebrews chapter 3. This issue of faithfulness. Same. It's an em emulate a quality of Jesus. Notice verse 1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider, look at him, the apostle." And high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him. See, Jesus was faithful even when it cost him. You know, Jesus grew up in a real scandalous environment growing up. I don't know if we ever thought about that or not. You know, um, they supposed that he was a, <laughs> you know, there was rumors flying around, you know, that woman was pregnant before he was born. And they even called him born of fornication at one time. Do you think the um, names people may imagine growing up? Psalm 69 talks about how Jesus was treated, by the way, growing up. And, um, and so, but he served. He still remained faithful, even as a youth, without sin. Amen. Now, the Bible says here that he was faithful to him that appointed him. He was trustworthy. Where does he show up when he's, he shows up in the temple, confounding all of them with his wisdom? Amen. He stayed faithful to God. He was faithful to him that appointed him. And here's another guy that was faithful, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Amen. Moses is one of my favorite people in Scripture. Amen. You know, he, he was faithful in all his house. He had to endure a lot, too, but he, God could trust him. And, um, and see, that's what we want. We want to get to a point where God can trust us with more of his anointing, more of his power, because a lot of people can't be trusted with power. It exposes people. This is how a lot of people get off the road in ministry. You know, there are some manifestations, and then all of a sudden, they, they feel like, you know, got to do this every service, and it's not as the Spirit of God wheels, and all of a sudden, you can get derailed. Happens quite often. But if we're faithful, we just keep on plotting, you know. Um, I've made a determination that if the whole world turns back, then let's be one of those that keep on going. Amen. When the Son of Man, will he find us faithful? And jump, Yes, Lord. Help me to be faithful. And he's working that in me through the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we stay on course with him. God could trust Jesus to finish his work. Amen. And that's what we want to do. We want to be trustworthy in God's sight. That he can trust us to finish the race. That's what Paul did, wasn't it? He? he said, I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. Amen. Now is laid up for me. 
Amen. See, that's what we need to be working on. Staying faithful because so many are flaking off. And uh, even folk you didn't think would flake off. They flaking out, getting flaky. But not you. Amen. You're going to keep on serving. Amen. Hallelujah. And then if we are walking that faithfulness, that means not only can God trust us, amen, other people can rely on you. That means you can be a faithful witness, don't it? Amen. Not somebody that people say, man, I thought they were a Christian because they, they, no, no. The faithful believer is going to stay on course. Yeah, we might have ups and downs. You might even fall, but you get back up. Amen. Oh, you never quit. You keep on going. Amen. Let's look at the other one. Ooh, ooh, time is flying. Glory to God. What's the next one? Meekness. <laughs> the word in Greek is P-R-A-U-T-E-S. <laughs> I'm going to say pray you. <laughs> Amen. Well, what is it? What is meekness? Amen. That's one good nef- definition of meekness, strength under control. And um, I mean, you're submissive to God and what God said. And um, James 1.21 says, receive with meekness. So meekness then also is an attitude by which we receive the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. So that means I submit to the word of God. Amen. I'm not trying to read into what the Bible, what I want the Bible to say. I submit to what God says. It's not God said it. I believe in that settles it then. It's God said it that settles it. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. See, it's that submissiveness of attitude toward the things of God that causes me to align myself under what God said. And he's growing that in us. But it also is strength under control. Because a truly meek, submitted individual doesn't get big-headed when God uses them. Because you realize that the power to do what we've done in ours is his. Amen. You know, in Numbers 12, 3, the Bible says concerning Moses that this Moses was the meekest man. And um, and I used to think and think and think on that, you know, because he did operate in under control. God used him mightily. But that thought of submissiveness and humility When God uses you, see, it's yet not I, but Christ in me. Amen? See, as long as we have that right, then we don't get big-headed when God uses. Amen. You know, somebody said, well, you're a faith healer. First thing I said, no, I'm not a faith healer. It's the Lord that heals by faith in him. Amen? So notice here in Numbers 12, Here's that situation where they're, they're, they're talking about Moses, Miriam, and Aaron because he married an Ethiopian. And they begin to question him. You ain't the only person that God spoke through. <laughs> they said, had the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? <laughs> had he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. You know what the Lord knew that they were denying? What Aaron said in the court of the king was what God told Moses to tell him. Amen. Now notice the next verse concerning Moses. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord dealt with Aaron and Miriam and Moses had to intercede for him. Now (laughs) Moses stayed pretty much in that stance, that position of being submissive to God, even though God was using him mightily. How will you act? If you held out a stick and the Pascatank River split (laughs) and everybody walked across and it was dry land, man, that was kind of neat, wasn't it? Could God use you anymore? (laughs) 
we might not have gotten that far. Man, I threw down my stick and it turned into a snake. And it ate her, um, them other ones. See, it was his attitude toward God using him. He was meek. He operated in power, but he never exalted himself because of the power he operated in. He stayed humble and submissive. Stretch out your rod, you know. Touch the waters with it and it turned to blood. See, he never took credit. When we walk in meekness, we never take the credit for what God does through us. It's he in us that do it the works. See, that's a missive attitude to keep us from getting big head. Man, look at how God used you. No. To God be the glory. Amen. You know, um, God um, used King Saul, but he got into sin because he started, he wasn't meek. And so when the, the prophet came to him, he said, when thou wast a little in thine own eyes, God raised you up. But he got big in his own eyes, and he started thinking he could protrude into the priest's office. See, if we're meek, we'll stay in our lane. The one time I remember Moses got out, he was supposed to speak to the rock and he hit it. <laughs> you know, and that cost him being able to enter the promised land. So we've got to keep ourselves under control. All of us have great power through him, whether we know it or not. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So by our words, we can set somebody on a good course or destroy their life. That's what we say. Amen. You know, when we lay hands on the sick and they recover, that's God working through us. It's not us doing it. See, Jesus said, the father in me, he do it the works. And that needs to be our attitude where we operate in the power. We shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon us to be witnesses. But we never take credit for the manifestation of it. We know it's him working through us. Amen. And that way we don't get self-exalted no matter how uh, great an action or, or miracle God do through us. Amen. Don't get big-headed about it. Amen. Let's wrap up real quickly with this last one. Um, what's, the, what's this other one? Is it? Temperance. Temperance. Man, I'm... Uh, I'm just a human as an excuse for what I just did. Now, temperance don't operate like that. <laughs> a temperance simply means a self-control, self-mastered, able to control fleshly impulses. In other words, we don't just act out whatever comes through our head. We have a filter. The Holy Spirit tempers us and gives us control as we yield to him. Amen. So one person put it this way. Um, he said that the Lord told him that his wife was to him like temper is to steal. And if, you know, because otherwise he'd be brittle and break. Amen. Temperance keeps us from breaking. You know, we can endure stress uh, without losing control in our actions and our thoughts and how we respond back to other people. The Holy Spirit is working that out in us. In our flesh, we might just, somebody hit you, somebody do you wrong. I get you. <laughs> no, temperance. Temperance. Amen. And so we have to learn to temper our actions, don't we? We need to operate in self-control, don't we? And so the Spirit of God is working that grace in us so that we can control our speech. Amen. A lot of believers get like the world when they get angry. Amen. And they start speaking like the world. Need temperance. Amen. How do we get it? Abandoning in him. Amen. Discipline in our flesh and our mouth. And he changes our desires so that we can learn to talk. You know, a lot of us don't talk. Our, our speech has changed, hasn't it? You know, well, that's a, a work of the Holy Spirit in you. You didn't generate that. You know, some people get saved and instantly some things fall off of them. That's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In speech and in actions. Now, notice what he said, and then we'll, we'll just, we'll stop. Amen. Paul said when these um, manifestations of the 
Holy Spirit are operating through us. Meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Why is that you, you suppose? These nine fruit that he's mentioning, against these there is no law. Because if these things are growing in us, we're not going to break the law. We don't have to, you know, be under the old covenant law. As we learn to walk and live after the Spirit of God, then we're going to come in line with the laws of God. Amen. And so against these, there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh or put it to death with the affections and lust. And the key is if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. In Romans, he said, if we do that, we won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. So we're called to walk a new way. Let us not be desirous of vainglory. We, we'll do a separate study on that. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Vainglory. Amen. I guess we'll close on that little thought. Let us not be desirous of vainglory. You know, seeking the accolades of man, which is a quick way to get out of walking in the spirit. Amen. Let us not be desirous of vainglory to have folk boast on us or some people boast on themselves. See, so we have to measure ourselves. Amen. Am I, am I doing this for attention? You know, why am I doing what I'm doing? Amen. You know, sing well, but who are you singing for? You play good. Who you play for? You preach well. Who are you preaching for? <laughs> because if you do it for the accolades of men, then you get your reward from the people that clap you. And if you do it for claps, not only do you get the reward from the claps, you get to get manipulated to get them. So our attitude should always be to glorify God in our actions. Don't be desirous of vain glory. Don't seek glory for yourself is what he's saying. That's useless glory. They have the accolades of men. Amen. And it seems like he just inserts this out of the blue. Don't be desirous of vain glory. Provoking one another, envying one another. You know, he goes right into what we call chapter six. No divisions there, but we, we, we put a division called we stopping right here. Amen. And the chapter begins with six. But we search ourselves, not desirous of acceptance of men. Amen. We want to please God. And um, so we guide ourselves in that. But I guess in closing... Let's just stay connected. Stay plugged in. Don't let the lies of the world get you separated. They change every day. If your peace is in mask, you got a problem. That felt you said the other day, you need to wear two. You know, <laughs> see, see they, they always mess with your man's things. If two's good, three should be better. Where are you going to stop? That's all I got today. I, I went in the store. And he had on, no, I, was in the, I, I had to do blood work today for a physical. And, and I'm sitting in there, here come a guy, he got on the blue mask, and he got on this big black Masonic mask, got the big symbol on it. I guess that was vainglory, but I didn't get a chance to talk to him, would have loved to, but they called me. But, um, you know, heard already, two is better. See, if that is where my faith is, then I'm not going to have peace. Amen. And I'm not saying that to single that individual out, but there's so many words, so many things we see in here. If our trust is in that, then we can be manipulated because that's a false sense of security. Our security is Jesus. Amen. And uh, what he promised us as his people. So we're going to stick and serve him no matter what the world does. And uh, he's the one we trust. So anyway, we'll call it a night right here. Amen.